Hey guys, in this video, I'm gonna go over the steps we took and some pro tips on how to build a bookcase with a TV wall unit surrounding it. Our design had basically four base cabinet flat panel doors on the bottom with two vertical two panel panels flanking the side all the way to the ceiling and kind of a cubby surrounding the TV, all in the same plane. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the design process. So the design or sketch versus what I call story pole. So making a paper sketch or even a CAD sketch is often the first step in, in, in getting the design proportions decided. You know, that's the whole conceptual plan. After that though, after your conceptual design that you form, the next task is to take accurate measurements. Now you could pull out your tape measure and your pencil and draw a bunch of stuff on paper, but I'm gonna propose a better method and it's called a story pole. Story pole is a layout tool for measuring, marking, and transferring accurate measurements. Using a story pole completely eliminates the tape measure and the, the errors from pencil marks. It's more accurate than paper, and once marked, it can be used throughout the entire project continually to just check your process at every step. So for a story pole, I just take rips of quarter inch Luon. I like it because it's lightweight and, and stuff, but you can use one by three boards or anything, really. Um, I usually make three separate story poles or one on each side and then a smaller one. So I do the vertical height of the bookcase, the width of the bookcase and the depth. On that story pole, I mark everything. Locations, tops and bottoms, widths and depth of windows and doors, electrical outlets, baseboard trim, baseboard height, anything I need to, to know. Then back here in the shop, I will use that story pole to actually draw my project out and construct my bookcase on the story pole. Face frames, doors. Uh, I, I draw everything on the story pole, including you know the gaps between the doors, face frames, even the three quarter you know framing uh, on the boxes and the cabinet box panels. For this particular project, we chose birch plywood to build that cabinet. Um, as well as face uh, shelf frames. Um, the, the doors, um, we used a 3 8 birch plywood and then poplar wood on the frames, shelf nosing and door styles and rails. And then to cap it off, we got poplar molding for the top of the bookcase. All right, now, now we're in the shop, we've got a story pole. Let's talk about cutting things to size. So again, using that story pole for all of our measurements, all of them, we determined that our boxes base cabinet and upper boxes would be 15 inches deep, right, depth. So once our three quarter face frame and our quarter inch back panel are added, that would give us our 16 inch total depth. That's what we were trying to achieve. So we, we drew all that out, including the back panel and the face frame, and then we were able to figure out what we needed for the boxes. So we ripped all of our bookshelf boxes, components on the table saw and the track saw all at one time. And we also ripped our shelves at that time and we just labeled everything as we did, as we were cutting things. Because it just eliminates the guesswork later. Um, when you get to that assembly part, uh, one tip that I would mention is we purposely build our cabinet a half inch shorter than the ceiling. We always do this for three, really three reasons. First of all, the ceiling is probably not level or it might not be level. So that half inch gives you some room to, to do that. Two, it allows for easier installation because we could get it in without hitting the ceiling. And three, we knew our crown molding was gonna hide that half inch gap. We also built the project as two components and we built that uh, so we could do it here in the shop and I could get it out my bulkhead, but uh, building it in the shop, ease of transport and ease of installation, having it in components. Um, one pro tip I'll give you is uh, when you start your bookcase at the very bottom, start your lowest shelf off the floor at baseboard height and, and use a plywood subframe under that to give that shelf stiffness, but keep that off the floor a half inch. And I even keep my back panel off the floor a half inch and just my sides touch. This subframe will later get covered by the baseboard or face frame, so it doesn't matter. You're not gonna see it. Um, but starting your lower shelf at that height, it accomplishes a couple of nice things for you. Three things, actually. One, it allows for the bookcase basically to span over the uneven bumps and things of the floor. That's why we keep it up and we keep that sub base up. Two, it provides for a backer and nailer for the face frame because you've got that sub plywood under your shelf. And three, 
it looks nicer and you can basically wrap your baseboard all the way around the room and around your project. We didn't do that on this project, but you could. Um, all right, let's move on a little bit to making the boxes. So I was taught to use what's called tongue and groove method, or I should say tongue and dado method, because it was the strongest joint. Unfortunately, it also requires a large table saw or a dado blade to make the cuts and back and forth changing the blades and um, it's, it's more effort. Other methods include things like using biscuits, tenons, dominoes, screws, or even nails, right? We've seen it all. It really, it really all depends on your skill level, what you have for tools, how much time you have to invest in your project, so on and so forth, right? For this particular project, we used screws in areas that would be hidden, such as the base cabinets on the sides because we knew we had the uh, vertical panels to hide it. Um, and in visible areas, we just used 16 gauge finished nails, glues, uh, tenon, wherever we needed, and um, later filled them with wood filler. So uh, moving on to talking a little bit about our face frames. So two different face frames, upper and lower component. Uh, we primarily uh, use them to hide the exposed plywood edge laminations, right? And it gives thickness and depth to the bookcase. It's also really useful to hide the gap between your adjustable shelves because you need a little bit of space to get your shelves in. So that's always nice because you can leave your face frame in a little bit. Face frames just provide a really good looking, durable edge. And they, pr they protect vulnerable edges from damage or high wear also. I like to use solid wood edging like poplar because I can shape it with a router. I can, I can create a bead on it like a 3 8 bead detail a round over, a cove, or other desired details. So for our particular project, we decided on an inch and a half face frame and two and a half style and rails for the doors. The bottom of the bookcase has a three and a half inch, like kind of a base, as does the top that gets the crown molding cover. Um, for the shelves, we applied shelf nosing to the shelves and that's for deflection. So <clears throat> the base cabinets have basically one adjustable shelf in each unit, side-by-side -side unit, two doors each. The shelves are three-quarter birch plywood with one and a half inch edge banding basically on that on the door's edge and that that accomplishes a couple of things. Um, we used a Rockler shelf pin jig to, to basically install four holes on each side, four, uh, two sets of four holes on each side for adjustment range on the shelf and I like that instead of running holes the whole way. Um, and the solid wood nosing that we apply, it basically stiffens the shelf. And that's super important when you're determining spans and trying to avoid shelf deflection. So the longer the shelf, the more deflection it will have, right? So the shorter the shelf, the stiffer it will be. So just keep that in mind. The shelf nosing eliminates that. Uh, when we got to attaching our face frames, so like the plywood boxes, again, we use the story pole and we cut and label our face frames all at one time. And once finished, we dry fit everything. Then we mark them and we cut them, uh, we cut it, used a Festool domino and we basically cut in um, uh, tenons or uh, dominoes, I guess. But you could use biscuits or pocket screws as well. It's an option. Um, one tip I have for you guys is dry fit everything, double check with the story pole, and then apply clamp, uh, glue and clamps. Dry fit at every step of the way. Uh, as far as clamping goes, another tip for you guys is uh, you can use these 90 degree clamping squares to kind of help with assembly and squaring your face frames, because everything has to be square. Now you can buy these, like I used um, uh, Woodpecker's version, but you can make them. I used to use plywood. I used to have my own plywood ones, and you can build your own clamping jig. And when clamping, ensure that your face frames meet and are square, but also they're flush. Now, if they're a little high on one end or something, minor inconsistencies will be sanded out later. That's not a big deal, but you want to make sure that they're flush the best you can. Uh, when you get to the sanding process, one tip I want to mention to you guys too is once that bookcase, base cabinet, shelves are assembled and kind of all put together, I like to sand them before I put I, I put the face frames on the boxes and so on and so forth because especially before you put the end panel the back panel on because you can get the sander in there and you're not you know bothered by that you can sand all the items before the face frame and back panel go on I use like 80 to 150 120 grit paper 
for those face frames, um, I apply filler to all the joints and I let that dry. Then I sand the joints flush. Let's just make sure that everything looks perfect. And then I sand the entire face frame because I want to remove the mill marks because that can show up through the, can telegraph through the paint later. Um, once everything is sanded, we can put the back panel on. I used quarter inch birch plywood as the back panel uh, of the base and as, as the top. And what you want to do is you want to make sure you check your diagonals. You want to make sure that your frame, your box is square. And after you check those diagonals, you can apply your glue and put the, the plywood backing on that. And what I would do is I always start on one side and I work my way along the edge, checking for square along the way. And as you work that plywood edge, you're fastening as you go. The plywood alignment process, I guess is the, what I would call it, helps square up the bookcase as well. Now for fasteners on that back panel, I use 3 8 inch crown staples. You could use nails or screws. It's no big deal. Um, I do want to tell you a tip though. Our project, our sides were hidden because we had those side panels hiding the edge. If you choose not to have a side panel, you're just going to have a birch plywood, then what you need to do is you need to rabbit your side panels to accept your back panel so that the back panel edge, the plywood edge, does not show. You don't want that telegraphing. Um, right, we got to the shelves. Uh, for installing those shelves, the upper bookcase shelves on our project are fixed, but the base cabinet, like I said, has one shelf on each side and they have adjustable pins. And we used the self-centering jig like I talked about, and we did three holes per hole, pair of holes, and that gives us our adjustment on either side, you know, maybe two or three inches either way. For the face frame, we attach the, uh, the face frames um, is fastened to the base cabinets and the upper cabinet with glue, brad nails, um, and clamps. And once that glue is cured, I go around, I fill all the nail holes, all your visible seams, anything, any imperfections, um, as well as the face frame to plywood connection, I fill it all. And then I go back when it's dry and sand it all off. I usually, um, I also like to use a block plane to slightly ease all the sharp edges on the poplar, on the nosing. Um, then I'll sand the face frame, the entirety, flush and, and the plywood to face frame seams flush, all of that. Um, as far as the doors and the side panels, so we went with like a raised panel look, but it was a flat panel look. So um, the next step in our process was to build the bookcase doors and recess panels. So we decided um, on a true style and rail construction. Um, but look, you could build yours out of plywood and, 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 and attached trim if you wanted to. Um, style and rail construction is a technique that's been used forever at, for making doors and wainscoting. And it basically involves a, a floating panel. It could be a raised panel, could be a flat panel. We went with flat. So for milling, uh, again, we refer to the story pole for everything. We rip all of our stock to size, clean all of our edges up um, on a joiner, and our, uh, just to make sure everything is nice, straight, and square. Um, and then once the stock is straight and flat, we use a shaper and a coping style bit to make the necessary cuts. And you could use a router to do this, but we have a shaper, so we use a shaper. These styles, the long parts, they basically receive a long, detailed groove, bead and groove along the entire length of the board, and they run the whole length of the doors and the whole length of the panels. The rails basically receive the same detail, but they also receive end coping so they can cope and fit on top of the, the styles and rails. They all fit together. So for this project, we decided to use 3 8 inch birch plywood for our door and side panels. Now the 3 8 is just a little bit too big to fit into our groove. So what we did is we just used a, um, a, a date like a, a, a rabbiting bit to just take off half inch all the way uh, half inch wide by just a smidge all the way around the perimeter of the panel and that's just shaving a little bit off a smidge to get it to fit inside the groove nicely without forcing it um, one tip I'd, I'd just say to you is that when you're measuring and sizing the panels off the story pole I, I uh, please just use the story pole go by that but you could you know, you could use your face frame, I suppose, and uh, use that to fit things and make sure things look right or double check as well. Um, and then uh, when you're doing your panel, you want to just, you, you could use your story pole again, or you just put your face frames together and measure your grooves and deduct an eighth of an inch. 
So once those panels are sized and fit and dry fit, everything can be glued together. And you basically only glue where the coping is on the styles and rails. The panel never gets glued to the frame. It's just, you just leave it floating. And that's gonna allow for seasonal movement of the wood. It, it's, it's separate, it floats. Um, one pro tip for dry fitting, on every step of the bookcase, dry fitting has to happen. If you try to go ahead and glue something clip and you find out later it was a wrong piece or you screwed. So you get a dry fit, test everything. Um, all right, moving on to the door. So now the doors are made, they're glued, we sanded them. Now you need to, uh, this, is the, this is the step to check them in your face frame. And if you need to trim them a little, this is a good time to do that. Um, our face frames on our cabinets were not flush with the cabinet sides. Remember I told you they were in a little bit. So depending on that, and the, depending on the hinge that you use, you might need to install some blocking just to flush out your hinge to the uh, face frame, the edge of the face frame. And that's what we did. We chose a 110 degree Blum self-closing hinge for our base cabinet doors. And we had to pad out the sides to get the hinge to work right. The hinges are hidden once the door is closed. Um, and the doors, once closed, install flush with the face frame, so the inset. And to drill the uh, hinge holes, we used um, a 35 millimeter Forstner bit drill press and a jig, and then we just measured everything out and drilled those holes. After the doors are dry fitted to the face frame and, and the padding is done, then you can start installing the hinges and the hinge mounts. Um, when installing the doors, one tip I'll give you guys is, I use that 3 16 Luon and I use it on the bottom, sit the door on it, push it against, set my gap, um, put my hinge on. That shim provides a perfect bottom reveal. 3 16, 3 16 of an inch, it's awesome. And then those Blum hinges have excellent in and out, uh, side to side, in and out capabilities with dialing the hinges in with a screw. There's two different screw adjustments. Um, I will note that if you have a situation where your reveal is too tight, this is the time to take one of the doors or both and just shave a little bit off, table saw, track saw, whatever, just shave a little bit off, get, get the reveal that you need. Um, after we added the doors, we just put a bottom and top door stop on the inside of the cabinet to provide a positive stop and backing for the door, in case a little kid bumps into it or something like that. Um, now we move over to the job site. Uh, we're ready to install. We've got to remove our baseboard so that we can get our base cabinet up against the wall. And once there, what I usually do is I locate all of my wall studs. Um, I transfer those lines all the way up the wall. I mark my center line on the wall. I mark my center lines on the top and bottom base cabinets. Um, that's just gonna help for alignment and, and checking things. The, um, the base cabinet then gets you know slid in place. We had to cut out for an outlet, line up our center lines, check for level and plumb against the wall, shim if you need to, cut your side panels a little bit if you have to play with some sort of hump in the floor. And if, um, I will say that those side panels, those sides are the only things touching the floor in the base cabinet. So cutting or scribing them, shimming, that's where you can get away with getting your level. We intentionally left that back wall panel, that back panel and that front toe kick high so that it would not touch the floor and cause any leveling issues. All of our adjustments are done by cutting or shimming the base cabinet sides, all of them. And then we shim the wall if we have to. Now, once we're satisfied with that, the cabinets level plumb on the floor, plumb to the wall, we install screws through the rear panel into the wall studs in the base cabinet hidden. Sometimes we even put a backer board that's installed in there for better screwing. And then the upper cabinet sits on top of that base cabinet. And it secures to the base cabinet with eight screws. Um, when we're building in the shop here, we used our story pole to locate where those partitions, those upper partitions were. And we pre-drilled those eight holes ahead of time just because we could and it was easy and it, it, it makes installation better. Now to fasten the upper bookcase sidewalls, the front portion to the base, we had to use pocket screws. We had to do that in the field because we, uh, we needed to get the face frames to line up because they were two separate face frames. So pocket screws on the outside helped us do that. Our side panels hid that. Um, now when dry fitting the vertical side panels, you first wanna check the, you know, check the fit obviously, dry fit, make your necessary adjustments and then you can get ready for the installation. Now, because we built 
the base cabinet and the upper cabinet as two units. These side panels, they run the full length. So they be, and they go right up underneath the crown molding and they sit on the floor. So um, they have to be installed and fitted in the, in the field and we gotta work on our seams there. It's gonna be hard to, hard to clamp it or whatever, but basically we dry fit and scribe them as needed and then we're gonna fasten them with glue and short finish nails. And we try to get the finish nails into the, the shelving. Screws could be used in areas hidden behind, say baseboard molding or crown molding and stuff like that. I, will want to, I do wanna give you a pro tip for, for the panels. It's a good idea to make these panels a little bit wider than needed. Just in case, you know, you shim the bookcase off the wall a little bit, or it's also a good idea to, to rip one side at say a 10 degree back bevel, and like the wall side um, of each panel. And this back bevel will allow you to push the panel in tight to the wall with only that pointed tip of that bevel touching the wall so you can actually slide it in. Additionally, if you do have to scribe it and you maybe you do a little bit of hand planing or sanding, you only really have to deal with that pointed edge and not the entire three quarter inch thickness. So that's a really good tip. The last component on the built-in is the crown molding, right? The crowning achievement. The crown molding is an awesome way to finish any bookcase. Even ones that don't go to the ceiling, um, I love to put crown molding on with a flat top. Uh, one pro tip on the installing crown molding is if your ceiling is too far out of level, strive for straight crown molding on your bookcase because it will show on the reveal on the face frame. And then you either cock the crown to the ceiling if the gap is cockable, or just float some joint compound to fix that gap issue. But don't put your crown to the ceiling. It's gonna screw up your miters and it just doesn't look right. Okay, so after all the components are installed, fastened, then you're gonna to wanna to go around and fill all the nail holes, sand, ease any sharp edges, and prepare yourself for paint. Make sure the door's open and closed, put your doorknobs on. Um, once everything is primed, that's the time to, um, the side wall panel at the wall, as well as the crown molding to the ceiling can be caulked, and then you're ready to paint. Guys, I hope you found this video helpful. Um, it was just an install that we just built. I figured I would take some video and photos along the way and just share them with you. Um, if there was something in this video that you saw that, that you, you'd like to learn more about, leave me a comment. I'll, I'll try to accommodate you guys. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up, leave us a comment, love hearing from you guys, and please subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell right there. I'm Rob Robillard. We'll see you at the next video. Take care.